Good evening, everyone. My name is Hilda Fernandez. I'm a Lacanian uh, psychoanalyst practicing in Vancouver, and it is my privilege and my pleasure to chair this interesting panel today entitled Weaponizing Words, the Dilemmas of Free Speech. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge, acknowledge that we are meeting in the unceded territory of the Moschian, Squamish, and Siliguatu peoples. So we want to acknowledge that. And we are here to discuss a controversial theme, freedom of speech. As you all know, this is the Article 19 of Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, and reads something like this. Um, people, human beings, have the right to express an opinion without fear of retaliation or censorship. Let's say I want to express how much I feel uncomfortable or in favor of X, Y, or Z. Or Z. This, of course, comes with responsibilities and restrictions. It has its limits, obscenity, defamation, privacy, perjury. So technically, you can express yourself as long as you do not interfere with the rights of others, that you don't harm others. One of the many problems is that my X, Y, or Z uh, is subjected to interpretation of what is harmful and what is an offense. We enter an absolute ambiguous territory. It's not a clear-cut definition valid for most of what is free speech. This situation has been present around uh, themes such as LGBTQ2+, feminism, sexual etiquette, or critiques to vulnerable or minority populations. This is also heightened in our informi information era, as we know with uh, sites such as 4chan. We are here then to discuss this interesting theme, and let's um, have this conversation in a civil, respectful way. Um, uh, my participation here would be to facilitate the conversation between the panelists and with the public, with the audience. We first are going to hear Samir Gandesh's um, talk, who has been focusing uh, on the importance of uh, free speech, particularly around academic freedom, as he has expressed in his recent text in Open Democracy in defense of free speech of last March. And then we will have the responses by Morgan Auger and Josh Patterson. So let me introduce Samir. Samir Gandesha is an associate professor in the Department of the Humanities and the director of the Institute for the Humanities at Simon Fraser University. He specializes in modern European thought and culture with a particular emphasis on the 19th and 20th centuries. His work has appeared in Political Theory, New German Critique, Constellations Logos, Kant's Studium, Philosophy and Social Criticism, Topia, The European Legacy, The European Journal of Social Theory, Art Papers, The Cambridge Companion to Adorno and Herbert Marcus, as well as in several other edited books. He's co-editor with Lars Rensman of Arendt and Adorno, Political and Philosophical Investigations, he is co-editor of two books with Johan Hartel of The Spell of Capital, Reification and Spectacle, and recently Aesthetic Marx. He also has contributed to Open Democracy, Canadian Dimension, The Vancouver Sun, and The Globe and Mail. In the spring of 2017, he was the Liu Bombing Visiting Scholar in Philosophy in the University of Nanjing and visiting lecturer at Sushu University of Science and Technology in China. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Samir, and we're here to hear you. Thank you so much, Hilda. Um, and thank you all for, for coming this evening. It's a, a beautiful uh, 
summer evening, and so it's uh, it's nice of uh, it's very nice to see you here in in in, in the audience to discuss um, this uh, this crucial issue, uh, crucial question. Uh, I think one of the crucial questions of uh, of our age. So I have a few things to say about that in a second before I get into the the substance of uh, of, of my talk. Uh, but before I go any further, I would like to uh, also acknowledge that we're on the unceded territories uh, of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, let me uh, just uh, provide a little bit of a, a, a context for uh, my interest in this in this question. Um, uh, it has to do really uh, with with a number of things, uh, which leads um, li which themselves lead to an, to a number of different uh, dilemmas. Um, f first, I, I, I speak um, as uh, as an academic, um, as a citizen, uh, but first and foremostly. Um, as a director of the Institute for the Humanities, I've, I've been um, director for, for several years now. And as such, I've really tried uh, working with the steering committee um, to uh, open the space up for um, a vigorous discussion of, uh, of difficult ideas, ideas that, uh, that often uh, challenge uh, um, the, the status quo, uh, the powers that be. At least this is what we would like to think. Uh, maybe it's not the case, but this is the intention. Um, I think it is the case, though, because over the years we have faced uh, mounting pressures um, to um, uh, change direction, to change tack, to maybe moderate the kinds of things that, uh, that we do. That gives me a sense that we're actually doing the right thing, that, that we are poised um, in a discussion here in this, uh, in this city, in the province, and, and, and hopefully to some extent uh, in the country. We're raising difficult questions and fostering difficult conversations. Um, so we've been criticized certainly, uh, as I said, from the powers that be, but also, so you'd say from the, from the right, but also we've been criticized uh, from the left for some of the choices that, that, that we've, we've made. Um, and some of the programming decisions that we've made have been um, decisions to invite people uh, to speak that we don't necessarily personally agree with, uh, but think that their arguments and their, their views are important to be aired and, and to discuss further. Uh, and this is a, a, a principle that we're absolutely committed to, uh, and I think this is a, a fundamental principle, uh, not just of free speech, but also of academic freedom. So this is something we're, we're going to continue to do, but I thought it would be worthwhile to reflect a little bit on this and to, to take this up and to try and think of um, uh, reasons uh, that, that could possibly justify this. And the fact that one has to justify this already tells us that we're in a condition right now uh, of crisis. Um, when I put it to the steering committee that we have a, a, a kind of forum or a discussion on free speech, well, hold on, that's controversial. I, you know, look, it, there wasn't a suggestion that we do otherwise, but there was a suggestion that, boy, oh boy, uh, we could get ourselves in some hot water. All the more reason, again, to have this forum and have this discussion. Um, we are in, in, a, in a condition of, of, of crisis in our liberal democracies. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons to really take this up in a, in a kind of robust uh, sort of way. But I really want to emphasize um, the dilemma in the, in the title of my talk um, on the dilemmas of free speech, or in the, in the subtitle. Uh, these dilemmas I, I really uh, want to take very seriously. Um, that is to say when one tries to create a uh, a sp an open space for free expression um, uh, of, of speech and, um, and ideas, uh, one courts um, the, uh, and, and we've seen how this is working in the last uh, few years, one quartz a certain kind of uh, willing and knowing attempt to cause others uh, uh, insult and hurt and harm. So one has to be really uh, aware of, of the stakes here. And I myself am extremely, extremely aware of this. Um, I have been myself the subject of uh, 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 racialized uh, violence, both through words and through action. Uh, one example in particular, which is a fitting given the fact that World Cup is on, 1982 I went to try out for a professional soccer team and I ended up uh, on my way back from, you know, unsuccessful unfortunately, but on my way back uh, um, on a train from uh, uh, Aberdeen, west, western part of, uh, eastern part of Scotland, um, to, uh, to London. Uh, and I was in a train filled uh, with, I believe, Arsenal supporters. Uh, and 
I don't, I, I really thought that I wasn't going to get out alive that, that night. And the guy that I was traveling with, who's also a, a, an aspiring player, uh, thought the same. Uh, we were under siege. So I, I, I understand full well uh, the dangers that are attendant upon, uh, upon free, uh, free speech. Um, but I also am committed to the idea that we really need, um, for the reasons of dissent, for, the, for political reasons, to create a kind of space where we can uh, defend and indeed um, employ free speech and expression um, to um, uh, engage in um, uh, uh, speaking truth to power. I think this is really uh, uh, vitally important. So the last thing I'll say, just as a kind of preliminary note, is that um, I uh, try to bring to these reflections uh, what Edward Said calls a kind of contrapuntal uh, approach. And the contrapuntal approach is the approach of uh, of the exile, of somebody who does have uh, allegiances to more than one place. And one of the things that has also made me very wary of the kinds of group identities in the name of which free speech could be curtailed is the experience of my own family, uh, which was um, uh, expelled from Uganda in 1972 on the basis of a certain kind of uh, agenda of Africanization. Um, and this has always reminded me about the violence of identities and the, and the violence that can authorize certain kinds of limitations on um, uh, speech and expression, on individual liberty. Uh, so this is part of, in a sense, my contrapuntal approach, and that is that we can't just talk about free speech in the context of what's happening in, in uh, the downtown east side, or in Vancouver, or in BC, or uh, in the country as a whole. There's a, a larger world out there, and a global context. And in that context, if you look at the question of free speech and expression, things look quite different from how they look in North America, especially in the United States. The United States is exceptional, not in the sense that it wants to understand itself, um, US ex exceptionalism, but in its uh, absolutist, ideas of freedom of speech. I don't even think those, those ideas are, are fully absolutist, but there, there does seem in the United States to be comparatively fewer restrictions on, on free speech. So we have to be quite aware of these contexts and the way in which we respond to the, the, this, the unique context that we're in, but also recognize that overall there is a global uh, trend towards authoritarianism. There's a global trend towards uh, cracking down on the conditions that would allow for dissent. I think we really need to make this very clear to ourselves and think about that when we're addressing the limits and possibility, possibilities of free speech and expression here and now. And the kinds of, let's say, uh, costs that that might uh, uh, give rise to in terms of a defense. Um, that is a bit of a, 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 an opaque point, but I hope it'll be, be a bit clearer once, once I, um, I get into my talk. What I've done is essentially taken the, the open democracy piece, and I've um, tried to sort of think through some of the, the arguments and counter-arguments around free speech. It's really me just trying to think things through. I think that itself is almost a political uh, act in and of itself, because it's saying, look, there are arguments, and we need to take them seriously, take the arguments seriously on, on both sides. You know, what are the justifications for, and what are the counter-arguments against um, uh, unrestricted uh, uh, free speech? And then, what happens when we come out the other side? Um, if it, in places it seems a little unclear, uh, it's because I'm thinking this through. I don't have any answers. If you're, if you're coming here tonight to say, well, you know, Samir Gandesh is going to give me the answer on what free speech is, what its limitations are, and so on. Forget it. I'm not going to do that. Maybe Josh can help uh, in, in that respect, probably better than I can. But um, I would just want to think these, these questions through a little bit. And it's actually part of um, a, a number of essays that I've, I've sort of worked on in the, in, the, in the last while, some of, you, some of which have been published, others um, haven't. Um, but questions of cultural appropriation, questions of symbolic politics versus um, politics addressing uh, um, uh, structures of inequality. These are the things that I'm, 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 I'm thinking about. And in fact, I, I was just approached this morning by uh, a publisher who's interested in uh, this question of um, social inequality versus symbolic politics because it, he thought it was heterodox and therefore important to integrate into a kind of discussion. So it's kind of in that spirit uh, that, that I, I, 
uh, I offer this, uh, this set of reflections. So the, the first starting point for me, really, and I've got um, a little bit of an outline here to preliminary marks, is it's just a, a historical sketch. I, th I think it's important on the left, um, and I've, I've seen myself position myself very much on the left here, um, is to remember that um, free speech and, and expression uh, is fundamentally grounded in uh, the bourgeois revolution. And the bourgeois revolution uh, comprises of a series of, of uh, historical events. Um, the Renaissance, the, the various Protestant Re reformations, um, uh, the Peace of Westphalia, uh, ending the, the Thirty Years' War, 1648. Um, the uh, Industrial Revolution starts at the end of the 18th century. Uh, and of course, the, the political revolutions uh, of the 17th and 18th centuries, the Glorious Revolution, 1688, um, the um, uh, American Revolution, 1776, the French Revolutions of 1789 and 1848. Um, These are really crucial in constituting uh, the bourgeois revolution. How we situate ourselves vis-a-vis -vis that revolution, how we situa situate ourselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the French Revolution in particular, and also the Enlightenment, is really crucial to how we'll approach these questions today. Uh, and I think this is uh, really important to, to keep in mind. So um, what I try to do is really focus in the talk on the significance of the um, uh, the Copernican Revolution uh, in particular. The Copernican Revolution, uh, which is in a sense completed uh, by Galileo. So the watershed moment was uh, here of Galileo, who with the recently invented uh, instrument of the telescope was able to, de to definitively show the veracity of the revolution in physics initiated by Nicholas Copernicus in his book on the revolution of the celestial spheres published in 1543, um, postulating the heliocentric as opposed to the geocentric picture uh, of the universe. Heliocentrism had been declared to be a heretical view uh, by the Inquisition in 1666. Uh, uh, five years after the Nazi seizure of power in 1933, Bertolt Brecht wrote the, the play Life of Galileo, in which he explores the relationship between the dogmatism of the church on the one hand and the new scientific outlook represented by Galileo on the other. One of its most um, powerful scenes is the one in which the astronomer is engaged uh, in a discussion with church philosophers who point to certain passages in Aristotle's writings as evidence for geocentrism. Galileo instead enjoins them to consider the evidence presented by the telescope in which he shows um, the Medician stars as evidence for heliocentrism. Galileo was tried and condemned by the church, as people, uh, some people will know here, uh, in 1633. Fortunately for him, he was sentenced only to house arrest until his death, which was much less a punishment um, than was meted out to Giordano Bruno, who had been burned at the stake at uh, Campo di Fiore in Rome, 33 years earlier for the crime of making a similar defense of the heretical Copernican uh, model. Now, I just want to um, show you a short clip. It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite good. Shall we begin with an observation of the satellites of Jupiter, the Medician stars? Sit down here, please. Thank you, my boy. No, I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. Before we use your celebrated instrument, Mr. Galilei, we beg the favor of a disputation. Subject, can these moons exist? A formal disputation? Why don't you just look through the telescope and see for yourselves? Here, please. Uh, yes, yes. You are aware that your proposition, that there are stars revolving round some centre other than the Earth, that there is nothing holding the universe up, is in contradiction to the wisdom of the ages? Yes. Apart from my mathematical friend's reservations as to whether these moons are possible, I, as a philosopher, ask you, are they necessary? <laughs> Aristotle, I, divine I, uh, Shall we speak in everyday language? My colleague, Mr. Ferrazzoni, doesn't understand Latin. Does that matter? Yes. The debate will be less brilliant, but it's your house. 
The cosmos of the divine Aristotle with its crystal spheres and their mystical music is an edifice of incomparable order and beauty. Why should we go out of our way to look for things which can only strike a discord in that ineffable harmony? Your Highness, would you care to observe these unnecessary and impossible stars through the telescope? Mr. Galilei, nobody doubts that your brainchild, or shall we say your adopted brainchild, is brilliantly contrived, but one is tempted to observe that if your tube shows something that cannot exist, it must be a rather unreliable tube. How is that? With the utmost deference, Mr. Galilee, I suggest that what one sees in your eyeglass and what is in the heavens might be two entirely different things. Admirably put. Great restraint. They think we painted the Medicean stars on the lens. <laughs> Are you accusing me of fraud? Yeah, we wouldn't dream of it in the presence of His Highness. Is there something wrong with my stars? Your Highness's stars are fine. The gentlemen are only wondering whether they really exist. Can you see the claws on the great bear? Yes, and everything on the bull. Are you gentlemen going to look or not? Certainly. What's the matter with you? They're stupid. Deplorable child. Your Highness, I have just received an important message. I think we should go at once. Gentlemen. The sum of our knowledge is pitiful. It has been my singular good fortune to get hold of a new instrument that brings a small patch of the universe a little bit closer. It's at your disposal. Make use of it. Your Highness, ladies and gentlemen, where is all this leading? Are we as scholars concerned with where the truth might lead us? Mr. Galilei, the truth might lead us anywhere. Your Highness, these nights, all over Italy, telescopes are being turned on the sky. The moons of Jupiter have never been seen before, and yet they exist. The man in the street may conclude that a good many other things may exist if only he opens his eyes. Gentlemen, we ought to be defending shaky doctrines. You are teachers. You ought to be doing the shaking. I wish your man would keep out of what is supposed to be a scientific debate. Your Highness. It looks as if we have to go to the shipyards nowadays to find the high curiosity that was the glory of Greece. Well, I'm sure Mr. Galilei will find admirers in the shipyards. <laughs> your Highness, I find this highly informative discussion has exceeded the time we allowed for. It is imperative that we leave at once. What if I cakes, Your Highness? But you need only to look through the telescope. His Highness will, of course, seek the opinion of the greatest living authority, Christopher Clavius, astronomer-in-chief at the Papal College in Rome. This is a key point. The truth might lead us anywhere. And the, the church is very concerned about this. Um, and I think uh, it's something to bear in mind. When, uh... So the uh, alternative model or paradigm of the heliocentric world would form the basis for the scientific revolution, both in terms of its content, a universe with the sun rather than the, ar rather than the earth at its center, and its form, a new method of science based on the empirical testing of hypotheses um, and, uh, uh, what, uh, and the, pre the presupposition of what Edmund Husserl called the mathemat mathematization of nature. If the Aristotelian philosophers were conducting normal science by seeking to square new evidence with the guiding assumptions of the existing concept of the world, then according to philosopher and historian 
of science, Thomas S. Kuhn, Copernicus and Galileo were engaging in revolutionary science by challenging those very premises. That is, by literally turning the established picture of the universe upside down. And this was to be of great consequence. It far exceeded the relatively narrow realms of philosophy, theology, and science, but contributed profoundly to the unsettling of social, economic, and political relations. This would, of course, be, it would have, uh, of course, been Breck's interest. Um, the scientific revolution was both the expression of and laid the foundation for the future bourgeois order. This was so because taken with the other events that I, I just mentioned, the Copernican revolution led to a fundamental disruption of the idea that all of being demonstrated um, three basic features. One, plenitude, or the idea of fullness. Two, continuity. And three, most importantly, um, gradation that established a hierarchy um, from in on, inanimate objects like stones all the way up to uh, the ends, ends perfectissimum of God himself. This is what the Johns Hopkins intellectual historian, Alfred O. Lovejoy, called the great chain of being. I want to emphasize the radicality of free speech in this respect because it explains why it is recently taken to be central to the agenda of the left, uh, broadly construed. And I'll just make a very quick uh, point here. It has been taken as, as central uh, to the left's project um, up until, I would say, the, the, um, uh, the late 19. Uh, 80s, um, and this has to do with a number of things. Uh, just, just briefly put, and I can, we can come back to this in the discussion if, if necessary, um, you have an increasing emphasis placed on the role of recognition and the, and the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the possibility of misrecognition, um, disrespect, or indeed non-recognition is, is constituting a kind of harm to the person. Uh, and this is something that we see in, in the work, especially of uh, uh, our own Charles Taylor. Uh, uh, but also, it, it's, it's present in, uh, in Franz Fanon's work, and I'll, come, I'll mention that uh, again uh, a bit later. Um, so you have that, you have at the, at the same time, in 1988, you have the Rushdie Fatwa, so this is then a recognition of the kind of harm um, or insult um, uh, uh, could, that could be done, or insult and therefore also understood as harm uh, that could be done to um, a particular community um, through the, uh, in particular here in this case, the publication of the Satanic Verses. So 1988. Then you also have uh, an increasing influence at this time of anti-porn uh, feminists such as uh, McKinnon and, and, and Dworkin, who come to understand uh, porn as a kind of uh, hate speech and also as fundamentally violating um, uh, equality provisions of the U.S. Constitution. This is um, uh, a, a, another dimension. You can actually layer another uh, uh, one on, and this, is, um, the, this goes back to the 1970s. In the 78, um, you have the publication of Ori Orientalism by Edward Said, and you have a post-colonial critique of the way in which the other is uh, presented um, uh, as um, uh, always already inferior and subordinate to the West. So taken together, representations matter. Representations can be violent. Representations then can also be um, restricted in particular kinds of ways. So I think that the, the question of, of, of free speech, we might want to say, oh, well, it's, it, 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 we've, we've become more sensitive to the question in the, in the last uh, uh, few years with its weaponization by the, by the alt-right, uh, people like Richard Spencer, of course, Milo Yiannopoulos and, 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 and others, Breitbart and you know, 4chan and, and, and so on. But it's, there's a, a, a longer story here, and one of the things that I really am intent to, to indicate in the open democracy piece is the way in which um, it's not uh, fascist speech or potentially fascist speech, uh, far-right speech that's being target, targeted. It's often speech on the left. So leftists trying to uh, silence other self-identified leftists. Uh, case of Rebecca, Rebecca Tuvel, case of uh, Dana Schutz, uh, case of uh, Laura Kipnis. And, and there are uh, indeed many others that we could discuss in the, 
in, in, in the question uh, period. Um, so, of course, in writing Life of Galileo, Brecht, the writer who, in response to the communist East, East uh, uh, German government's statement that it was disappointed with the people, famously quipped that then it should dissolve it and elect another, was not just concerned to represent the event for its own sake, but rather sought to grasp this momentous historical event as it flashed up in a moment of danger, to use his friend Walter Benjamin's expression. And the specific danger, of course, was then looming within months of the completion of this work, um, uh, the foreign ministers of Germany and the USSR, please make sure your phones are turned off. Um, uh, Great demonstration. <laughs> that's right. Um, would sign a non-aggression pact, clearing the way uh, for the invasion of Poland. One year later, in the year of his suicide, in his uh, theses on the philosophy of history, Walter Benjamin would write that nothing has corrupted the, uh, um, the German working class so much as the idea that it was moving with the current of history. The lessons of Galileo and the European Enlightenment that he so influenced um, are, are clear to us today, I think, in relation to a left whose dogmatism parallels that of the mid uh, 20th century um, at an equally dangerous moment in our own history. Those parallels, I think, are, are important. And of course, we don't have the kind of historicist faith in progress that the left did back then, uh, but we do have a sense that morally, we are in the right. They, that is to say the 20th century, uh, uh, um, mid 20th century left, might have had a uh, sense of historical truth. We on the left today have a sense of moral truth, and it is on that basis that we feel a little compunction about shutting down those with whom we disagree, even when we may, uh, in fact, be on the same side. That is to say, there are other people who, who share uh, relatively similar interests. They certainly can't be uh, regarded as fascists, but we still want to shut them down because we don't like what they say. We are offended by what they say, and they should not be able to say what they say. This is our situation today. But what, but what Galileo was engaged in was science. And in science, it's possible to postulate with some qualifications progress in our understanding of nature, not to mention our control and domination of it. But it's also possible, but is it also possible to speak of progress in morality and art? I think that it is. Still, I think so. Um, it can still be maintained that free speech and expression played and plays a key role in the struggle for gender uh, equality and for LGBTQ plus rights. The expression of gender identity itself is today relatively less encumbered by the preju prejudices of tradition and religion, although they have not uh, um, been eliminated, without a doubt, and this is, I'm sure, going to uh, come up, I would expect it to. Um, while there's much equivocation surrounding the significance of the Enlightenment, as in Kant's famous definition, humanity's emergence from self-incurred tutelage, what Marx would in fact later call alienation, that is a condition in which the products of human activity um, are then elevated above and oppress uh, uh, living, um, uh, uh, breathing men and uh, women. Its basic slogan was sapere ode, have the courage to know or think for yourself. I would add, even if it offends others. The principle that the individual ought to be able to think and express themselves freely is axiomatic, goes without saying, in the constitutional framework of liberal democracies, but it is under fire insofar as liberal democracy itself is under fire. Today, it is up to us to think for ourselves how we ought to live uh, our lives, how to make and remake our identities, including our gender identities and its expression in the fullest possible sense, uh, but that the space for actually doing this is becoming ever greater, uh, ever more greatly uh, foreshortened. Um, what about art? Can we talk about uh, progress in, in, in art? Um, art history is a story of transformations over time of, a give, of what a given civilization or culture is considered to be meaningful, valuable, sublime, and above all, beautiful. Innovation depended on the artist's ability to challenge the existing content and form of art, even at very great risk to themselves. In the Renaissance, for example, both underwent a profound transformation that quickly opened up a chasm between Renaissance and medieval art, though one wouldn't want to emphasize the, um, the, the, uh, um, the opposition too much. I'd get into trouble with my colleague Paul Dutton, who wants to see some of the, the, the continuities. Um, but we have a chasm here, especially in the, in, in, in the realm of painting. 
At the level of content, religious subjects such as the Virgin Mary, the Passion of the Christ, and other biblical tableau uh, are relinquished in favor of increasingly secular themes such as the everyday life of commerce, sumptuous portrayals of the considerable and growing wealth of the emerging bourgeois, not to mention colonial uh, order, dynamic representations of the hunt, realistic depictions of human anatomy, etc. Et At the level of form, the new Renaissance painting becomes increasingly based on perspective and the creation of beautiful illusion. Here at least, there was more or less agreement on the primacy of the aesthetic category of the beautiful. Fast forward to the 20th century uh, in, in, in interwar Europe, uh, in which, on the back, uh, backdrop of the carnage of the Great War, an aesthetics of beauty is supplanted quickly by an aesthetics of the ugly as artists sought to hold up a, to society a mirror of its own bloodied image. After the Second World War, in a similar spirit, Theodore W. Adorno would argue that poetry has the same right to exist in as much as the tortured man has the uh, right to scream. That's a, a paraphrase, not an exact quote. Um, so what I then would like to do now is just go through some of the arguments uh, pro and uh, contra uh, uh, free speech. It's not quite the right way of putting it because nobody's arguing against free speech as a whole, but um, really pro and contra restrictions uh, on uh, regulation on, on, on free speech. That's a, a rather long section now in, in the paper and I, I think I'm, uh, I'm having to watch my time a bit. So I think I will just... Um, go through and summarize them and read them out. Um, but there is an important set of distinctions that, that can be drawn here first or should be drawn before I go into uh, these, um, uh, these arguments, pro and contra. Um, and uh, yeah, so these have to do not just with um, the, the, the question of uh, uh, free speech, uh, but the relationship between equality and liberty, and also the relationship between free speech and academic freedom. That's something that I haven't really touched upon so much yet. Um, as Oxford political philosopher uh, Teresa M. Bejan has recently reminded us in the pages of um, Atlantic Magazine, or Atlantic, Atlantic Monthly, uh, it is important to distinguish between uh, isagoria, literally equals within the agora, which implies the equal right of all members of a democratic political community to speak and to be heard, and parhesia, uh, literally all saying. Uh, the first entails <coughs> reciprocity uh, within a community of equals. The second entails being able to um, speak uh, one's mind, willy-nilly, unhindered. As Bejan states, and I quote, in ancient Athens, Isagoria described the equal right of citizens to participate in public debate in the democratic assembly. Parhesia, the license to say what one pleased, how and when one pleased, and to whom. Okay, so you have an, uh, this opposition. If liberal democracy embodies uh, an insoluble contradiction between the principles of equality and liberty, then Isagoria maps onto the democratic principle of equality, Parhesia onto the liberal principle of freedom, understood in <coughs> terms, freedom as, uh, as constraint. For Michel Foucault, Parisia was the freedom to speak truth to power. It is, in other words, the right to transgress. These two are, as, already, as uh, already suggested, are in tension with one another, but also one could say in, in, in a certain level of a certain kind of tension with a third concept of speech, um, which is uh, embedded in the philosophical tradition, uh, which is um, logos, which is to say ordered speech that entails dialectic, or what Karl Popper will later call, also a philosopher of science, will call um, a, 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 a logic of conjecture and refutation. It would seem that the democratic public sphere includes, to different, to, to different degrees, all three, while the university community would emphasize the first and the third, specifically in terms of governance and inquiry, respectively. So um, free speech within the public sphere is free speech, free expression, um, within the university, uh, free inquiry. And the, the limits of that inquiry, or who is able to participate in that inquiry, is regulated by um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, by the faculties, by professional associations, by journals, and, 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 and so on. Uh, one actually is, is uh, one uh, presupposes a certain kind of equality, the other doesn't necessarily, uh, um, in terms of who gets to count as, uh, as an academic. Uh, 
So I go through the, the various arguments. Um, I, I basically distill them down, and, and maybe if I'm, I'm missing uh, uh, missing some of them, you can you can uh, remind me um, and point them out. But I, I think that there's essentially three kinds of arguments in favor of. Uh, free speech. One is uh, based on rules and deontological. Um, one that uh, goes uh, to to Kant's view uh, of the way in which we ought to treat um, uh, other rational beings. That is to say, always as ends and never is simply means to uh, ends. Um, so that grounds uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, understanding of free speech in terms of this first concept, Isagoria. Um, the, the second one uh, could be understood, uh, uh, and typically this is the, the antithesis within ethical theory, uh, consequentialism. You, you judge um, a, a particular phenomenon by its effects or its consequences. Um, so free speech here could be understood to be justified in relation to the um, uh, sum total of uh, good over bad consequences, the sum total of pleasure over pain, uh, a kind of utilitarian calculus. Um, and that we can't really predict where, uh, the, um, uh, where the pursuit of knowledge will take us. Right? We can't predict in advance. We have no way of knowing. And this is also Milton's argument uh, in Aeropatica that we can't, there shouldn't be censorship in advance of books uh, because we, we really don't know what those books mean yet. Maybe in the, you know, once we've seen the, the, the effects and the implications of, 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 the, of, of those books, then it might be possible to uh, uh, argue for censorship, but not in advance. We can't censor, censor in advance. Um, the, th the third argument is really a kind of, I sort of call it a kind of legitimacy argument. So even if we uh, can't um, uh, agree with either the deontological or the, the consequentialist kinds of um, uh, uh, justifications, both of which, by the way, uh, are, are manifested in John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, uh, he draws on both kinds of logics. He's coming right out of a utilitarian tradition, but he's also now really exercised or, or concerned by uh, 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 Alexei de Tocqueville's problem of the tyranny of the majority and really wants to carve out a space for, uh, for individual liberty. And, and so he comes up with, uh, with the harm principle, the liberty principle. Uh, and this is essentially that um, uh, one is free to do what one uh, likes uh, as long as one doesn't harm others. People, I think people are probably quite familiar with this, and I think it's had a huge impact on, 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 our, on our legal system, on the way we think about um, uh, uh, our, our ethical, moral intuitions. I think it was also prior to Mill uh, uh, articulating this in On Liberty there in the, um, in the US Constitution. So, but he, he lays this out in, in terms of both kinds of logics deontological kind of reasoning, consequentialist reasoning. I'd say that even if neither of these two positive justifications uh, work, if you don't accept either of them, maybe the, the assumptions don't, uh, you, you can't buy the assumptions of, 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 of either, um, and, and think that, well, you know, that may open the door to a, a kind of restriction. Um, the question then uh, really leads to who gets to decide? Who gets to decide? And this becomes a big question when we look specifically at the, the Rushdie fatwa, right? Um, uh, who, who is in fact the uh, community that is uh, uh, being um, uh, insulted and therefore harmed? Who uh, represents uh, the community? So I go through and, and provide some, some counter arguments uh, uh, and I could sum those up in the following terms, and I've been told that I, I have to, to move on, so um, I could sum those up in the, in the following terms, really uh, questioning the uh, autonomy of the individual, locating the individual, embedding the individual in social relations. Um, what uh, 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 flows from that is that the individual has a responsibility for um, uh, his or her uh, speech acts, uh, specifically in terms of the problem uh, of harm, which is now redefined um, in terms of offense. This is one of the things that Mill tries to keep separate and distinct. Harm and offense, these two uh, must be kept separate and distinct in Mill's view, but there's an increasing tendency to want to understand for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, especially the, the, the question of recognition and the damage misrecognition could do to, to persons, misrecognition, disrespect. These uh, 
uh, uh, uh, instances of offense could also actually be understood not just as offense that one can brush, brush off easily, but in fact harm to, uh, to one's sense of, uh, of self and therefore agency and, and, and therefore you know, one, one's, uh, one's rights. Um, so these are the, the kinds of reflections that, that, uh, uh, that I raise. One of the important arguments, and this is mentioned in my abstract, is that of, of Herbert Marcuse, who makes a, a, a very famous, very controversial argument about the repressive nature of tolerance. And his argument is that tolerance was a really revolutionary idea in the 19th century when capitalism was really consolidating itself and you had open contradictions in, in society that could lead in a number of different directions. In particular, there was the possibility uh, of, of what uh, figures like Marcuse uh, and, and others working in that tradition would call the negation of the negation, right? So the, the negativity of capitalist society could itself generate its own negativity, that is to say, what Marx uh, calls capitalism's, or the bourgeoisie's, grave diggers. So socialism was very much on the rise, and it seemed to uh, be possible to think about socialism emerging organically out of capitalist society. With the developments of the um, early part of the 20th century, the, the failure of the, the German and Russian Revolution with the consolidation of capitalism after the Second World War, you have an increasingly totalized structure in which those seemingly um, radical, contradiction, uh, radical contradictions within a society that would point beyond them no longer do. What they do is simply reinforce the existing uh, Order And so what Marcuse's argument is, is that allowing for um, a, a kind of context in which there is as free, uh, there's as much freedom as possible for speech and expression, you don't actually have the possibility of this challenging uh, the powers that be, challenging the overall structure of society, but only deepening uh, its hold by, in a sense, legitimizing uh, those those structures by saying, "Look, you know, we have we have plenty of freedom. Uh, you, you have the uh, uh, you can point to any number of, uh, of of forces in society that seem to represent this." Um, it's it's a contradictory position, and as I've I've said elsewhere. Um, uh, I've written a, a, a little piece on uh, Marcuse's argument with Adorno over the, um, the occupation by the students in uh, Frankfurt of the offices of the Institute for, the Social, uh, Institute for Social Research. Marcuse thinks that this isn't such a bad thing and Adorno is opposed to it. Um, and I think this leads in a sense to certain uh, really, um, uh, leads in a very uh, uh, um, potentially authoritarian uh, direction. So I, th I think that has to be uh, challenged. I, I'll just come to to my my conclusions uh, now, and and that is that the burden of proof at the end of the day to to give free speech as wide um, a purview as possible is uh, to suggest that um, the harm that's claimed by vulnerable vulnerable groups um, is. Uh, uh, um, uh, serious. It has to be taken uh, 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 with uh, uh, with with the utmost um, uh, 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 t t viewed with the utmost I importance. But at the same time, um, it is vital um, to be aware of what the implications um, uh, are for for opening up. Uh, um, or for creating the context in which there are, there are greater um, uh, restrictions. One of the things about uh, our, our worry about hate speech is that often hate speech doesn't manifest itself as such. One of the things I, I put in, the, in, in my conclusion is that one can open a, a, a newspaper and see um, uh, uh, headlines that ha run to the effect that um, we are being swamped uh, 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 by, um, by migrants and refugees and so on. This can't um, in any way be understood um, to constitute hate speech, uh, uh, but yet you see a pro pro proliferation of such forms. So there are limits in terms of what can actually be legislated against in this in this respect. Um, that's what I had had put in my my paper. But uh, I think just yesterday uh, morning, National Post ran with exactly that headline. And if people saw this, Toronto, um, city of Toronto uh, faces a tide of migrants. Right, that is damaging. 
that is the kind of speech that is a prelude to genocide. It cannot necessarily be legislated against. It has to be confronted by other means. It has to be confronted by arguments, by critique, by exposure. Right? So that's, 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 that's one uh, uh, argument. Censoring, legalizing speech can be said to disarm it, but it can also be said to further weaponize it by making it dangerous, by making it, uh, giving it a mystique, and giving it a power that it might not have had. And this is why you've had communities uh, like the gay community and uh, the black community, uh, and I think now the disabled rights community, that take words that have been used against them as epithets and turn those words into, um, into means of, of, of defense. Right? Uh, queer, for example, the word crip, it seems to be used in this way. Um, I think this is a strategy that, that Judith Butler defends, uh, I believe, in excitable speech. This is, this is quite, uh, quite important. I think there's also the argument about um, driving um, hate speech underground, where, where it festers uh, and can't be aired and, and addressed directly. Creating a censorious environment on the left, and there's no doubt that there has been a censorious environment on the left for some time under the guise of social justice, identity politics, and so on. And, and maybe, perhaps for some good reasons. I, I don't want to dismiss it. But one of the effects, whether you agree with it or not, one of the effects is surely it will drive young people away from the left. It will drive some one, young people away from the left. It will make them apolitical if it doesn't actually push them to the right. That's not good in the long run for counteracting Hate. The last point, and I think that the major argument that I'm making in this constellation of shorter essays, is that the, one of the things that the left has, has em emphasized less and less um, with its greater um, uh, 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 foregrounding of, of identity questions is the problem of inequality. And I think that at the end of the day, if we're really focused only on censorship, only on curtailing uh, freedom of speech and expression, only on protecting people from offense, which in some cases might, might well be justified, but if that's our only focus, we're treating the symptoms and we're not dealing with the disease. What is the nature of the disease? We need to talk more about that. My intuition is it has got something to do with the growing inequality around us and what certain political forces are doing in terms of presenting that reality to society. And I don't see enough pushback there from our side. So there are, there are a few other things that I want to get into, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and we can uh, open that up in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Lots of uh, things to discuss. Now we are going to move into the response by Morgan Oje. Uh, Morgan Oje is the executive director of the Morgan Oje Foundation, which works to narrow the gap between human rights laws and as they are written as, and as they are experienced by Canadians. Morgan Auger was the BC MDP candidate in the then BC Liberal stronghold of Vancouver Falls Creek during 2017 general election. Working across party lines, Auger has become recognized as an effective community organizer and educator, changing hearts and minds to help win significant change on issues focused around equality, LGBTQ2+, inclusion, and accessible education. Auger has helped shape Canada's human rights law, write police policies, improve healthcare delivery, pen policy for K-12 education, prevent extrajudicial deportations overseas, protect trans youth in schools, and formulate national transgender policy. Previously on the city of Vancouver LGBTQ2 Plus Advisory Committee and on the Vancouver District Parent Advisory Council, where she served as chair. Auger volunteers on the Vancouver Police Department, the LGBTQ2 Plus Advisory Group, with Women Against Violence Against Women, WEVA, and mentors aspiring young politicians with intersectional experiences. Welcome, Marjan. Mar 
Sí. Can you hear in the back? Do you need a speaker, right? I can take this one, actually, the, the handheld. I've got some experience with handheld speakers. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, when I try to describe what I do, I think, I think the, the shortest thing is I try to set precedents in courts that forever stop people from hating on others in a way that I disapprove. <laughs> so the foundation works to narrow the gap between our laws and the application on the ground. We're specifically focused on marginalized communities. Currently, we're supporting. Oh, yeah, this isn't working. It's not oh. up there. How do we do what that? We need to do? We're going to do something here. Currently, we're supporting a case where I'm a complainant in the Human Rights Tribunal, OJ v. Watcott, which um, seeks to address uh, specifically hate speech. So actually, I have skin in the game in the question of hate speech against free speech and about where the constraints are. Huh. Oh well, I'll use my slides and I get to see them. <laughs> if you go to my Twitter, well, you won't. Go to my Twitter account. They, what happened to your look, show? Isn't that like great. a print screen? How do you switch screens? Yeah, I Anyways, <clears throat> control. I work in the world of applied freedom and justice. Oh, maybe that's it. <clears throat> Rather than in the wor that, that's, world that's good, yeah. of theoretical um, justice and injustice, and in particular, I focus on a little bit of the opposite problem than Samir focuses on. I focus not on the freedom for the minority voice to be heard to bring out new ideas, <clears throat> but the, free, the protection of the minority population from people exercising their rights to talk to oppress and crush the communities. And this is a real problem. Um, two weeks ago, a friend of mine died of suicide. She died of suicide because her laptop got hacked. You'd think, <clears throat> you'd think one would have the resilience to survive something like this. But of course, she was coming from an experience where she's been living under oppression in every step of her life. Uh, you know, incident after incident after incident. Before her laptop was crashed, she suffered profound discrimination in a hospital in Vancouver. Before that, you know, she was, in, she was in a hospital to deal with chronic pain that was related to a car accident where she was distracted by a hateful incident that involved <clears throat> people speaking to her in a horrible, horrible way and caused her to be distracted and she ran a red light and got into a terrible accident. She <clears throat> was here in British Columbia because she had fled from Nova Scotia where she had, had, she had been essentially drummed out of her job as an apprentice, as an electrician because of transphobia at the workplace. All of this comes from people speaking their mind. And some people speak their mind foolishly, but some people go further than that, and they do it viciously, and they do it on, viciously on purpose. And I'm here to kind of talk about why we have limits on speech, or the kinds of limits we have. First of all, let's talk about limits we have in life. There are speed limits in life. There are limits on property damage. We can't go and do whatever we want. We can't just take whatever we want, whenever we want to. We can't kick people, or worse. And we have limits on polygamy, right? Strangely, we don't have limits on polyamory, but we have limits on polygamy. And in British Columbia, we have the Human Rights Code. I'll try to be really quick, which basically says, you can't publish or issue or display bad things, right? Statements, publications, notices, signs, symbol, and emblems that A, indicate discrimination or an intention to discriminate against a person or a group or a class, or B, is likely to expose people to discrimination or hatred or contempt because of the protected attributes. We've got this enumerated list of things you can't publish garbage about people about. Now, of course, it doesn't apply to private communication. I can send a hateful email about various people and it's, it's protected. It's also, this is just publications, it's not speech. In Canada, we have something similar, advocating genocide. 
I think we all understand why that's important, right? Um, advocating or promoting genocide. Sometimes people get overly obsessed with one specific genocide, which was horrible, beyond horrible, but there have been many genocides. And some of them have been quick and dirty and fast, and we haven't thought about them as genocide well enough. Uh, but you know, the systematic eradication of a community because of who they are, that's a genocide, right? It doesn't have to all happen on a Tuesday, it could take years, but it's still a genocide. We talk about the First Nations cultural genocide, we talk about the 60s coup as being part of a genocide. Um, it's important to appreciate that this stuff, that, that such things can, can be far-reaching. Public incitement of hatred. Mr. Watcott of OJV Watcott is actually facing criminal charges under 319.1. He was arrested a few days ago for his actions in uh, Pride Parade in, in, in Ontario. It's interesting to me that he did the exact same actions against me, doesn't face criminal charges here, but that's for another day. Anyways, uh, inciting hatred likely to lead to a breach of the peace. It's, you know, interestingly enough, the, the test is breach of the peace, which is very hard to, to d define. And finally, the willful promotion of hatred. You know, other than in, of course, private conversation, promoting hatred is a bad, bad thing. There's also a little bit about mischief, which I thought I'd throw in here because actions, you know, like for example, carving something into a into a door is, is a form of communication in reality, and that falls under mischief, motivated by, you know, actions motivated by bias, prejudice, and hatred. So basically doing dirty tricks or damage to things is, is, is part of expression, it's part of speech. And keeping on going. So, there's precedent for this. People don't quite appreciate that there's a solid Supreme Court precedent uh, in Saskatchewan versus Bill Watcott, and a whole bunch of other people, um, which, uh, which, you know, it's a very big list of people and organizations. But it actually said that using expressions that expose a group to hatred, hate speech, seeks to delegitimize groups in the eyes of the majority, reducing their social standing and acceptance in society. This was part of the ruling. Hate speech, therefore, rises beyond causing distress to individual group members it can have a societal impact. It lays the groundwork for broad attacks on vulnerable groups that can range from discrimination to ostracism to creating the situation for suicidality to segregation, deportation, and extreme cases, it goes to genocide. And we know this. We've all, we've all studied World War II. We all know how this was set up. We know how gen that genocides were set up in other places through speech. It wasn't set up through a gradual increase of Violence, usually it's a sudden outburst of terrible behavior based on what people have been saying. And this is the issue. When you're in a very, very small community, transgender people, we're one third of the population. We're as rare, roughly, as natal twins, except that we also suffer from bias. And of course, other communities suffer from bias and stigma. And people speak freely about how we're wrong somehow, just like other people. And it's very, very important to have limits on uh, free speech. So there are alter, uh, this was about distributing flyers, and ultimately what, what the Supreme Court uh, ruled was that uh, passages of these flyers combined many of the hallmarks of hatred identified in case law, because we have case law about what hatred looks like. It has to be pathologizing, it has to be demonizing, or it has to be associating people with a vilified population. For example, pedophiles. You know, if we say iPhone users are pedophiles, that's hate speech. But iPhone users are not a protected class, so you couldn't follow up on it. The expression portrays the targeted group as a menace that threatens the safety and well-being of others, makes reference to respected sources in an effort to lend credibility to the negative generalizations, and uses vilifying and derogatory representation to create a tone of hatred. That's what hate speech is. Saying, you know, um, saying uh, your science is wrong isn't hate speech, but saying you are all pedophiles because you're in this room, that's hate speech. Pedophiles is an easy target, I know. <laughs> Their conclusion, it was not unreasonable for the tribunal to conclude that the expression was more likely than not to expose homosexuals to hatred. Of course, this was a ruling, so it was, you know, it wasn't, a Supreme Court ruling. So, 
show and tell from my life in the last 12 months. You know, free speech or hatred? That was an attack on me and my writing when I was running, actually it was before I ran. Um, reasonable arguments about how trans women are predators and were being passed around to try to, to, try to give a reasoned argument why uh, human rights law shouldn't apply to us. Uh, KKK flyers distributed in Abbotsford. Uh, this one was picked up by a friend of mine on his front lawn. You know, a mixture of leaning on religion and re leaning on demonization. Uh, Anti-Chinese sentiment in uh, the Vancouver area last month uh, related to, you know, demonizing a population based on some of them have bought homes, some homes are expensive and therefore Chinese people are bad, something like that. It's hate speech, rallies with signs and posters, you know, don't mess with our children, stop, uh, you know, sex isn't fun, parents have rights. It's innocuous enough, except that it's underlying on some very, very significant hatred. For example, the idea that talking about the existence of gender identity or sexual orientation um, violates a parent's right to have their children never know that this exists and messes with the children by making them queer, right? So it is actually pathologizing uh, signage. Um, at the same sign, international Jews are behind sexual orientation, gender identity, and kids' as education. That's a really good one. He was following me around trying to tell me about them. All the them. And finally, let's talk about the consequences, right? So I deal in anti-trans violence and so forth. The consequences, this is a proportion of young trans youth, ages 16 to 24 in Ontario from a few years ago, talking about their outcomes. And really, the important thing here is the, difference, the different columns. The column on the left, the dark blue one, is um, people who are supported by their family and their community. And the, people on the, and the, the light blue one is the people who are ostracized youth. Okay, so the first one is satisfaction with life. Second one is excellent physical health. Third one is excellent mental health. Fourth one is high self-esteem. Do we see a pattern here? When you're ostracized, when you allow people to spew hatred in writing and in social media and so forth, it has consequences. People actually get hurt. It causes deaths. Kids, for example, in my community, I really follow this really well, Kids who we allow to be subjected to hatred are three times, sorry, have a one in three chance of not making it through high school. They kill themselves. If they are not, if they're protected, they have the resilience of the other kids. And this is just hard data that's irrefutable. Finally, there's a trend in Canada. Hate, motiv hate motivated crimes, even though there are very few, have been steadily increasing. Um, now, this is only looking four years back. I don't know what 2017 and 2018, but I know 2017 is further of an increase. We need to manage hatred. We can't stop people from having feelings and beliefs, but we can manage how they communicate it. And there's a big difference between me saying, I think iPhone users are bad people because they do dumb things because iPhones are a tool of the week, and me saying, iPhone users are pedophiles. These are two completely different ways of saying things. And that's why we have hate speech laws, to manage how people communicate. And ultimately, when we create bias, we create stigma. Stigma creates harm. Harm creates alienation. Alienation creates delinquency or this, this, this uh, engagement, which causes more bias, which causes more stigma. And it's a vicious circle. If we manage how people communicate with each other, and prohibit the extremist behavior, we can actually really manage um, the health of communities. And this is very, very important to us because everybody here one day will be a taxpayer. It's much cheaper to prevent than to repair. I think just that on its own is a good argument. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you. Our last uh, respondent is Josh Patterson. He's a lawyer and the executive director of the DC Civil Liberties Association. Josh got his start acting as the director of the Freedom of Expression, Equality and Dignity project at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association in Toronto. After moving to Vancouver, 
in the territories of the Muskian, Squamish, and Coastalish peoples. He joined a BC union side labor and human rights practice and spent much of his time working on one of the BC largest racial discrimination cases in history. Josh's uh, career as a lawyer has focused on protecting some of the most marginalized people from human rights violations, civil liberties restriction, discrimination, and environmental injustice. He has worked for several years as, the, as a lawyer for First Nations in their fights to protect their constitutional rights and their inherent legal authority. His work has included law reform and policy advocacy, public education, community organizing, government relationship, and litigation. Josh holds law and master's degrees from the University of Toronto and clerk at Ontario's Superior Court of Justice. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Samer for the uh, presentation, and um, it's a real honor to sit here with you, uh, Morgan, uh, uh, who um, I've admired your civic leadership for a really long time, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you tonight. Um, I am, uh, just want to share in the acknowledgement um, that we're here in the unceded uh, territories of the Skohomish, uh, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh people. And when I'm talking about the law today, and charter rights and stuff like that, I want to acknowledge that I'm talking about the law uh, and rights within settler society. By doing that, I recognize that that society is imposed by force on another society, on another legal order that I'm not expert to speak on. Um, uh, but I wanted to recognize that that's what I'm doing when I'm talking about our law. Um, I'll also recognize that uh, uh, what, what is uh, obvious, perhaps to uh, most of you in the room, uh, that I'm someone who is never subjected to discriminatory remarks. Uh, to racism, to gender discrimination. I've happened by the accident of my birth um, into a great many advantages, and while I may have struggles, none of those are on account of my skin color, um, my gender, my gender expression, or my sexual orientation. Um, so um, uh, that's something that I certainly recognize as I sit here and pontificate about the harms that are done to others uh, and how we ought to uh, respond to them. Uh, the BCCLA, really briefly, uh, is a human rights organization that's been uh, operating here in BC for uh, more than half a century. Um, uh, some things that we've been involved in, in addition to freedom of expression, is the recent case uh, finding solitary confinement unconstitutional in federal prisons, last week's complaint against carting at the VPD for discrimination against Indigenous and black folks. Um, uh, working on um, issues to do with the border and, and uh, refugee rights here in the country. Um, and of course, long-standing work on LGBTQI equality and trans plus rights, um, including one of our, our biggest um, victories of our existence, which was lay at the intersection of um, LGBTQI uh, equality rights and freedom of expression, which was the Little Sisters case. Uh, which we took all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada on behalf of a, of a queer bookstore here in uh, Vancouver uh, that was waging a fight against Canada Customs who had deemed arbitrarily a, a great proportion of its materials to be obscene and harmful just because the government and the officials of the day uh, didn't like it and thought it was gross. Um, and so would destroy or stop shipments of everything from pornography through to stories and, and, and all kinds of different material uh, that was coming to Little Sisters. We fought that to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, with Little Sisters and ultimately we, we won a ruling that they had been singled out by customs officials for um, arbitrary censorship by the government. Um, so the BCCLA's um, uh, position in this uh, dilemma is that we, uh, the association, um, considers, and I think this is no surprise, that the willful attempt to promote hatred against any identifiable group is, Im is immoral and is to be fought against. Uh, but we also argue that um, uh, expressions that form part of those attempts um, should be largely protected from, from legal sanction, and there's reasons for that. 
It's clear that the accumulation of vilifying and derogatory comments can and do create an atmosphere of shame. They can result in the silencing of targeted groups and individuals. Hate speech, as Morgan has um, uh, shown this evening very powerfully, can and does create real harm. Uh, it can make people more susceptible to physical attacks and other discrimination. Uh, it um, is very serious in that it strikes at the recognition of individuals and groups um, as equal participants in our community. Um, and the question for the BC Civil Liberties Association has never been about whether something ought to be done about it. The association's answer has always unequivocally been yes. Something should be done. The question for us is what that thing is that should be done. And the great concern for our association over time, flowing directly from our work and the, and, um, the evidence in our work, is um, that we are very concerned and afraid about the use of the coercive power of the state as the go-to solution because we're uh, very fearful of the potential consequences and harms that can uh, come from that state overreach and from those, um, from those responses. So why, why is it that the BCCLA says that? Um, it is because out of, it comes from a concern to protect democracy. Um, you know, you, we could get into a lot more John Stuart Mill things about, and other philosophers. I'm, uh, you've, I think you've covered that very well this evening. I don't need to get into that. Um, uh, but, um, well, let me take, let me go through a few examples. So, Last summer, there was a lot of public conversation of these issues in town after what had happened in Charlottesville in the United States. And uh, I bet a lot of people in here would remember uh, that there was going to be a, an anti-immigration rally here in Vancouver. It wound up being virtually non-existent, but there was going to be an anti-immigration rally. And of course, there was a massive counter-rally in which we participated, which was a celebration of equality and inclusion and, and was really a powerful denunciation of hatred and racism, which I appreciate doesn't happen every day and doesn't happen in the many atomized individual um, instances where people are discriminated against. But in the media, it was reported at the time that there were some people demanding that the city shut down the anti-immigrant rally before it even happened. Um, some had said that people ought to be arrested on site for showing up, this was reported in the papers, before they'd even uttered any words, merely based on uh, an idea as to what it was that they might be saying. Uh, some were suggesting that the city responded, well, our hate speech laws don't allow us to do that. Um, and some responded by saying, well, they ought to be expanded then. If the law doesn't actually stop them from speaking, the law should, and so we, we should be talking about expanding the law. And um, we found those arguments to be troubling um, because we've been dealing, particularly in recent years, with attempts by the government to um, attack free speech in a whole range of areas. One example was the fight against Bill C-51, which many folks in this room might have been engaged in, might have been marching uh, against it and, and signing petitions and all kinds of things. And folks may remember that that included, for example, uh, new prohibitions and expanded prohibitions on speech, um, a, a new crime of promoting terrorism in general, very vague. As, as Morgan has sh showed us this evening, the laws that prohibit sp hate speech right now in Canada are actually very, fairly narrowly tailored. I mean, you can say racist things, you can say them on a stage that doesn't get you there. Um, you have to be willfully promoting um, uh, hatred, which involves a real high level of vilification, um, uh, almost an, an, an incitement. Um, but in C-51, it wasn't nearly as narrow as that. It was terrorism in general. And we and many others denounced that law, and probably lots of folks in here denounced that law, um, because it, it made it impossible in some cases, it was, it was theorized that the scope of it made it impossible to even dis get into discussions to understand people's views or to talk about um, resistance efforts against oppressive governments elsewhere, that if you were um, 
objecting to the uh, to the takeover of Crimea in Ukraine by the Putin government, and arguing for um, saying that you supported the resistance of that by by armed uh, means that. Technically, you could come within the ambit of C-51. You could fall under C-51 and actually be breaking the law. Um, uh, there were, we have very similar concerns about uh, moves to, uh, or suggestions that the prohibitions against hate speech in Canada as they are now ought to be expanded, um, which isn't actually what Morgan has necessarily said, so I'm not trying to make a straw person out of anyone's argument. But there are these arguments that, that what we have isn't enough, that they ought to be expanded, and we're concerned about it. Because um, uh, we have tended to learn through our work over and over that um, criminalizing a broader range of speech and ideas, things that we find abhorrent and terrible, don't necessarily make people safer. Um, progressive folks may remember and this is going back a ways. I was a kid then, so I don't remember this at the time, but uh, academic at UBC, Sunera Tobani, was um, threatened with uh, a hate speech prosecution under the existing laws because she basically said that uh, the US government had blood on its hands uh, and that was partly why 9-11 was happening was because of US interventions abroad and US brutality abroad over many years that was creating the circumstances in which these, uh, these re attacks might happen. And BCCLA was one of the, the groups that defended her at the time um, from this use by the, um, by the prosecutors uh, of this law to try and silence her. Um, much of the work that we done and advice we give around um, hate speech laws comes from folks who are con who are working in the Palestinian rights movement, who are concerned about and working on BDS, who are being accused on their campuses and in, and in places they're working, sorry, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in relation to Israel, um, who are habitually under threat um, from allegations of hate speech. Um, being excluded from events because they're perceived to be anti-Semitic um, uh, and having motions passed against them by the House of Commons um, saying that their speech is unacceptable. In the United States, um, too, we see um, threats levied uh, on, against progressives and those on the left all the time, including and especially uh, focused on communities of color and the vulnerable. The president saying that black athletes should be fired um, for engaging in protest, for example. Not hate speech per se, but, but you, him using his pulpit as the head of state uh, to condemn those people, to condemn news outlets that he deems to be fake, and to ask for investigations of those outlets. Um, they did try and convicted a protester of color who laughed during the uh, confirmation, Senate confirmation of Attorney General Jeff Sessions. It was overturned on appeal, but only after she had been prosecuted um, and successfully prosecuted. Um, uh, the ACLU, too, reports that one of the, the things they hear about the most in relation to these issues uh, in the United States is to do with censorship in, in relation to those advocating pa for Palestinian rights. Calls for Black Lives, Ma Lives Matter and water protesters on the Dakota Access Pipeline to be listed as domestic terrorists with all of the uh, things that uh, go along with that. Here in Canada, um, organizers and demonstrators against Enbridge and Kinder Morgan Pipeline actively being surveilled by the RCMP and CSIS. I am actually by law prevented from talking with you about the complaint the BCCLA filed about CSIS spying on Enbridge activists in this way. Because as part of the process of complaining, the state spy authorities um, have seen fit to subject me to a legal gag order so that I can't talk about any of the evidence or the allegations that I made against a spy agency. I can't tell you what it is I think they did. I can't tell you what I told the judge about what I thought they were up to. I'm just not allowed or I could be prosecuted. We are challenging that order, by the way. So we'll see where that gets to. But um, uh, the historically, the government, in our view, has historically used its raw power to try and silence people who speak truth to power. Historically, it's been progressives 
who fought to expand free speech guarantees, to fight for equality, to fight for LGBTQI plus expression, to do their art, to fight for the right of people to um, challenge government. And there's no question it's easier to enjoy free speech when you're privileged. And I think that that's a, you know, that free speech advocates, particularly white ones, often forget that or maybe they don't get clipped that way in the news. They'll say, well, you, have a right, you don't have a right to be free from offense. Um, never talking about the fact that, no, there's actual harm, and we need to recognize that. Or never being particularly self-critical about how easy it is for a, a white male academic to carry on about the importance of free speech when others are actively being denied um, uh, their ability to participate in those same discourses. Um, of course, uh, those rights fall more greatly in favor of those who are privileged, but we don't think the answer is to restrict that. We think the answer is to try and find ways to ensure that the voices that are being suppressed uh, also have the ability to, to have those rights. Um, and so, uh, to conclude, um, uh, the other thing, just to say that more coercive regulation isn't the answer then begs the question, well, what's, what is the answer? And that's another thing that I think um, oftentimes those who are defending free speech either don't include in their what they're saying or maybe don't get clipped by the media in what they're saying. I think it's a place where sometimes um, folks who advocate for speech, free speech fall down. And um, we think that, at least where we focus our effort, is on uh, work to build the legal infrastructure that is required to help protect and to strengthen those who are subjected to discrimination. Uh, for us as an organization, to the extent of our power to react powerfully against uh, discrimination. Um, so strengthening the legal system to reduce the incidence of discrimination and hate creating, in BC's case, a human rights commission, which other provinces have to do the advocacy, education, and critically research on the incidence of discrimination in other provinces and territories that we just don't have here. Try and bring a carding complaint against the, com the police when there are no stats from any agency about what's happening. Finally, someone managed to get some, and we filed a complaint, but it's been very difficult. In Ontario, they've got report after report after report on racial profiling because they have a human rights commission. Um, so strengthening the capacity to document discrimination and strengthening the capacity of community to advocate strongly against discrimination. And I appreciate that that doesn't necessarily immediately solve the problem for the individual person who is being subjected to that. And um, I think that's something that we need to, to think about. Um, we can't just say these things. We need to make sure that they're actually effective and it needs to be documented that they're effective in doing that. Otherwise, it's not much of an answer. Um, but it can't be the case that if, if the state's not gonna impose penalties on these uh, people for saying these things, unless it gets to this really um, difficult level, the state shouldn't also just be gone fishing and taking a pass on it as largely it has been here in BC for the last number of years. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of interesting discussion and question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, invite the audience to pose uh, your questions, but because we are recording this event, I'm going to ask you to come here to the um, podium here with the microphone. Uh, it will be a, a time in which you probably engage in, in answering, because there's an interesting dialectic that we can kind of pose in this dichotomy between silence and speech with all the nuances of power and uh, the legal uh, situations. But uh, is there anyone in the audience that wants to open the conversation with the panelists? If, uh, could you mind oh, coming we, here? Oh, I, 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 I think that would be the best. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of hard to get up. Yeah. 
I really came here to listen about the slat suits, and I don't know if you guys said anything about it, or did I miss it? Didn't say anything. Why didn't you? Because I ran out of time. <laughs> well, we'll give you ten minutes. <laughs> Please, they're very important. Sure. You know, they're absolutely important because there's such a thing as nobody's going to demonstrate or do anything if they think their house is going to get taken, mm. their mm. children's mm. Uh, university won't be paid, they, they get, their jobs are going to be lost. You know what I meant? They're, you know, I think that's more important than, I don't know. What? But it is important to you. Can I say something very quickly? Could, could I say something very quickly before you give the, 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 the proper answer? And, and that would be um, one of the things that we've done here at the Institute is uh, organized an, uh, a number of talks on, on slap suits. Um, I had a colleague of mine come, come in from uh, University of Guelph to talk about his book on, on slap suits. Um, and uh, I, just to, to uh, say something re quite closely related to that and something that Josh uh, mentioned, uh, we've done several things on Bill, Bill C-51. I think one of the best events we've ever had was a 350-person um, uh, event uh, that was an expert panel on C-51 and, and Josh's colleague uh, uh, Michael Vaughn was there and it was fantastic. We had Craig Forsese who is one of the two uh, main uh, legal experts on this law. So these are things that we are very front and center to us. I'm, I'm glad you raised them and, and, and thank you for raising the question. Josh. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, well, I know well, that, but there's, there's everyone else in the room, to too. too so. um, the nice thing about anti-slap suits is that we're going to have legislation here in, in the province of British Columbia, finally, to uh, regulate slap suits. Um, so in a sense, all of the work and activism that's led up to that has, uh, you know, knocking on wood that it, it passes the legislature um, and that the legislature holds together long enough to, to actually do it. Um, but the legislation will be passed. And, and for those who may not know, uh, slap suits are when... Uh, a company, for example, uh, sues you because you've spoken out against uh, something they're doing. Um, uh, you're, you're talking on a matter of the public interest, but they sue you because you're affecting their economic relations and so forth. And we've seen that in, in Kinder Morgan. Uh, we've seen that on lots of other uh, developments around the province uh, where people are really afraid to speak up, to write letters to the editor, to go to city council and talk about stuff because they don't want to get sued. And uh, the new legislation will mean that it doesn't mean people can't still sue you or try, but uh, instead of having to go through the whole trial and spend tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars defending yourself as to why it, you weren't actually libeling them or whatever, um, there'll be now a more quick and efficacious way of having those suits dismissed um, if they have the effect on you of uh, in interfering with your freedom of speech on a matter of the public interest. So that's new from the provincial government and we're very pleased. It's with based it. on the Quebec legislation, right? Based yeah. largely on the Quebec legislation yeah. and on sort of a unif. There was a uniform. Um, there were some academics who basically wrote uh, uh, a uniform law, a model law. Uh, there's Ontario's law as well. Yeah. Anyways, as far as we can tell, it's it's. Um, the best, it will be when passed the strongest legislation in the country. The previous legislation was actually drafted by our current president, Andrew Petter, when he was justice minister in the province. Mark. Okay, Thanks. yes. So, indeed, uh, the anti slap suit legislation was put forward by government on the 15th of May, um, when there's no reason to think it's not going to pass at this time. And it's, uh, so, it's positive. I wanted to highlight, though, that, you know, as soon as that legislation was proposed, my opponent in OJV Wadcott proposed that I was involved in a slap suit. So it was used immediately against our case. It was, you know, we beat it down, but uh, and all legislation has a double edge, always. There's always a downside to every law. Um, now people will say the thing is a slap suit every single time, and then you'll have to address that at an additional cost. I wanted to also, though... So it won't apply to human rights No, complaints. it won't apply to human rights complaints, that's right. You would have, so had, that's to, how we you would have had to sue him in, in court. Right. Um, but in human rights, which is a, a lot of what this is about, I'm struck by how long it took for my little case to get to a hearing. The hearing is tentatively scheduled for uh, mid-September, mid which is roughly a year and a half after the complaint was made. And... I happen to have the might of, you know, a legal team behind me. 
But if I had been on my own in what I'm doing, I would never have survived. Even just the simplest human rights complaint to a tribunal saying this person did something really mean. Um, we, a problem that we have here that I'm aware of is just the, the amount of time and effort it takes to get hurt. This is really unfair that people need to get high quality lawyers to argue just as simple as human rights law. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for the uh, the range of views here today. I want to push or try and get Morjan and Samir to do a little dance here around the question of uh, what works, and especially sort of like the the the, the argument that the cold, the you know the light of discourse and, and argument does a better job in dealing with uh, hate speech or however or offensive speech, and in, in the way that Josh uh, pointed out, the you know our Vancouver is so multicultural. Uh, a demonstration against the anti-immigration demonstration, and this specifically, specifically around this. So my my native informant in the Reddit world, which is to say my 17-year-old son, mm -hmm. tells me that whenever Reddit shuts down the incel and red pill and so on, all these forums, which are are, are sites of virulent hate, uh, misogynistic and transphobic and racist and so on hatred uh, and speech around uh, around uh, gender issues and very many others, uh, when when those uh, uh, forums themselves are shut down by Reddit. So that's not even the state. That's actually a, a private organization that's shutting down. So, uh, so that kind of, if we want to call it censorship, then what happens is those, those people don't stop being uh, virulent, hatred-filled, misogynistic, basement-dwelling, blah, blah, blah. Um, rather, they just go on to other fora and start other fora and so on and so forth. Which is to say that thing goes, if we want to use a spatial metaphor, it goes further underground. Mm -hmm. And so if what we want is for people who hold those views, I don't want to dismiss those the people who hold those views, and I would rather see them engaging in debate with others, and maybe I'm, I'm naive here, but I think sometimes that debate can lead to people changing their, their, their points of view, um, uh, rather than shutting them down. So if we want people to change their points of view so they do not engage in not only hateful speech, but hateful actions and violent actions and actions that cause harm and not simply offense to others, do we think the, uh, whether it's state or private censorship is going to do that work? Not, we, we, no, I don't think anyone in this room disagrees that that kind of language and that kind of speech can, can lead to horrible activities and can lead to the kind of um, 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 suicide, suicidal ideation that Morjan talked about. But is the shutting down of that speech by the state or by private, I don't want to just hold up the state here, is that what we think will stop that kind of activity? And just a bit of clarification both from Morjan and from Samir, please. Um, so I, um, thank you very much, Clint. That was, that was a really uh, excellent question. Uh, I think you could probably infer what, what my answer uh, would be, uh, but I'd be very, be very clear about it. Uh, I think that there um, should be uh, an attempt to bring those ideas in, into the light of day. I think what, you've, what you're signaling here, um, just uh, uh, parenthetically, uh, is, is a really crucial question, and that is, what has social media done to discourse? I think this is a, the, the, I think you're writing a book on it, right? Um, this is a, a huge question, um, because you have people like uh, Milo Yiannopoulos who make their names, on, who made his name on Gamergate. Right. Gamergate is this explosion of uh, virulent misogyny directed against this one woman who, uh, who uh, uh, is a video game critic and wrote uh, an unfavorable review of a particular game, and it, it just, the shit hit the, hit the fan. Um, so I think we really have to attend to the specificity of this, this virtual space. I think that's important. Um, uh, but I think, uh, yeah, m m at the same time, I think when people are in a face-to-face -face discussion, uh, people are much more inhibited. I think the, so Freud's social psychology would be very useful here in terms of understanding the uh, almost hypnotic effect of um, the, uh, the virtual environment, the, the, the elimination or reduction of inhibitions and, and the kinds of things that people are, are, are then uh, uh, permitting themselves to do or feel permitted to do. That has to be addressed. Um, I, I think that argumentation, yes, but if you, know, if you actually talk to social psychologists about engaging in arguments with real authoritarians, it's it's, it's um, uh, a uh, um, uh, counterproductive activity because it's taken as weakness and it only deepens their authoritarianism. But I think we need to figure out who are real authoritarians and who are just like kids trying to figure themselves out, trying to figure out the world and their place in it. Uh, and if we're too quick 
to dismiss them or brand them as far right, alt right, or whatever, then we're in, 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 in big trouble. So that's one thing. So yeah, yeah there are limitations to argumentation. The, the, the second very basic point is that we need to call out the right as defenders of free speech. They're not. They don't defend free speech. Richard Spencer made it very clear, and I think in the actions of uh, right-wing organizations, in their, the contradictions that they get, uh, they, they get embroiled in, like Jordan Peterson saying he's a, an advocate of free speech, but all these various faculties, including faculties of law, should be shut down. Uh, this is pretty clear, right? It's, it's cynical. It's a cynical use of free speech. We're going. So I've been dogpiled on on social media so many times. And it's a quandary. Um, should people be allowed to lie anonymously and use botnets to attack people? Why is, like, how is that? Okay, but if they do it in person, I can sue them for libel. Why is, what, what's so special about social media? I do recognize that an, an, an anonymity provides some protection for people who want to make a better world, change things. You want to be able to do some things anonymously, and some things uh, require anonymity, like voting, for example. But how is it that someone gets to, in my face, scheme to identify where my children live while threatening me, while I'm not supposed to have recourse to this? How is it that, um, that we say, Social media is a place where we, um, where we um, create a lab of ideas, but actually the lab is being manipulated by you know, vested interests who pay to have people set up botnets to attack you. How is it that I find myself in conversations with one person on five accounts that amplify each other in order to access my half a million to a million views a month? because they see me as a target, they see me as a high value target, and so they spend money to attack me and to discredit me. Um, I notice that almost all of the anonymous coward attacks come from overseas. I notice that when people have their name associated to their Twitter account or anything else, they are so much more polite, <laughs> right? And I notice that when I'm running as a politician and I have an army of lawyers at my side or the, the idea that there's a machine protecting me, that I'm not just one vulnerable person that you can crush, people are so much better. So I do value freedom. I recognize that revolutions have to be done in secret and, and identities have to be protected. But I do not understand why we hold up the ability of anonymous cowards to attack victims that have done nothing to them and do it without any consequence whatsoever, except their feelings being hurt when we take away their Twitter account. Can I respond real quickly to that? Um, now, some, some of the kinds of things that are described when they're threatening are against the law and properly against the law. They're crimes. And there's a question as to whether or not the state is focusing uh, has caught up with the technology to focus the right kind of energy on protecting people from those uh, sorts of things. Um, I, I want to recognize that I think we do need to think very hard, and associations like the one I work for need to think very hard and continuously rethink as technology emerge, uh, evolves, whether our arguments continue to stand up. Arguments, uh, you know, uh, that may have been designed when there was a different kind of discourse, when discourse operated in different ways, when harms occurred at different intensities and in different ways. Um, you know, we've seen mounting suggestion, and maybe there's evidence, maybe there's not, that it seems like there's evidence that democracy itself has been subverted south of the border and in some other countries by targeted campaigns, you're talking about botnets and these kinds of things, um, to with orchestrated and unchallenged falsehoods that are being marshaled uh, they're not being debated, they're being consumed wholesale by huge masses of people and we're only beginning to see the contours of, um, of that and we're nowhere un close to understanding what the implications are. And so I, I do think we need to think uh, very carefully about how um, 
how our arguments hold up to the extent to which they do in the face of these new ways of communicating and the new implications of that. Um, and that's something that I know that we'll be thinking about um, quite a lot over the next few years at the BCCLA. So I'd like to address the fact that um, by having a panel that is uniform uh, politically, you um, you've actually created a hostile environment for free speech in this room. Um, I have taken careful notes and I would be happy to take all three of you on on a point to point, point by point basis and could agree with almost everything that you disagree with almost everything that you've said and point out exactly how in each instance you're doing exactly what you showed in that video clip when you said this is the whole point assuming where the truth is going to take us. So that's the whole issue with the progressive agenda. It begins with saying we acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory, and it goes all the way through, again, point by point. Every time we mention a certain issue, a certain group, every time we tell a certain joke, express the derogatory opinions about a certain person or a certain type of politics or a certain position. Um, and so in the end of fact, the environment in the room is hostile to free speech. And that to me is the paradox of the left discussing free speech, is that the left always assumes that we know where we're going. We're going to a more equal, we're going to utopia. I mean, utopianism is at the heart of left-wing politics and left-wing theory and left-wing philosophy. And so we're going to a point of greater equality. We're going to a place of, um, of, of, of greater whatever agenda you want to, whatever identity, politics, social justice issue you want to put. And so I could, any point that I would take any of you on about, I have a feeling, I mean, I don't know if there are other people in the room who have critical thoughts, but they can't be expressed here. Please do. No, I, 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 what I'd like, what I'd actually like to talk because that's a waste of time, right? No, because no, that not. just, a, that not. just puts in person what Morgaine's just expect, uh, expressed happens on social media, and there's no point bringing that into, into the room and doing it over. We can all do that on Twitter any time, and many of us do. But I want to discuss. I want the question to say if you if you create an environment where you, um, where you believe you know where you're going. Can you ever answer the free speech paradox? Well, can I just answer? I mean, th By all means, um, it was a question. I'm going to take the mic because I took it before, before you answer. No, I'd like to hear it. Well, I'd, I'd, actually, okay. I'd, like, I'd like to go in order, please. I've, I've got a microphone here. So, so yeah, no, one, two, three. So I, I would just I would challenge the, the premise of, of, of your comment, which is, um, to say that the left knows where it's going. Uh, I mean, I think that the, 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 the various points I made, um, starting from the clip, is that we don't know where the truth will lead. That's why you have to, uh, where possible, maximize the scope for uh, discussion, debate, and of course, dissent. Um, that's far from a utopic position. In fact, um, if you look at some of the other things that I've written, um, I argue for a kind of uh, hegemonic politics, an alliance-based politics where there has to be negotiation and there has to be give and take, which I think identity politics, social justice politics, it, it precludes. Because you know in, in advance who you will and you will not work with. And there are those who are morally um, uh, beneath you and those who are at your level, morally speaking. Um, you'll work with those who are morally at your level and not with the others. I, I, so I, I really, I'm, I'm at a I, I'm complete loss, complete loss as to what you're saying. So, sorry. Okay, Morgan. Okay, so I'm a scientist. I'm an engineer. Um, I, so I, I, I don't come from... Uh, the arts. I come from the hard sciences, which tend to be binary in their interpretation of right and wrong, or true and false, or observed and not observed. Right. Um, I really struggle with the passing around of this concept of the left and the right. When I was trying to get trans equality passed in Canada, I worked side by side with the conservative party's queers in order to get them to get me in front of their own 
crew so that we could have a polite conversation about how to manage their extremist social conservatives. It's not a left and right thing. It has more to do with a goal and an intent. And when we try to get to that goal, we find the people who are likely to be our allies or the people who are likely to be swayed by our views. And now, he, I work in the evidence-based world, right? If there's the evidence that says something is good, then it's a good thing. If evidence is provided that my path is wrong, I'll, I'll take that. But I struggle with this hypersimplification of, of our society into the progressives and the conservatives. On every issue, people have different views. You know, uh, political strategists, they, 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 they struggle with this all the time. How do you get people to, to listen to you on enough issues so they get enough people to vote your party into power? Um, I think we need to look at things more from the point of view of how do you say stuff? How do you communicate your ideas in a way that you're not crushing other people, right? Because if a space, that public space is inherently toxic to a community, that community won't get hurt because they won't speak. Um, and, and it's important that ideas be platformed, always platformed. It's just that ideas that have as a basis the othering of a community or something like this are problematic. They have to be framed in a way that stand on their own rather than leveraging bankrupt ideas or bankrupt evidence that has been disproven. In, in my work, I deal constantly with disproven uh, data that is regurgitated over and over again. I think this is the challenge that I see. Um, thanks for your question. I'm not sure that I heard agreement. If we were to engage in Ms. Auger's case, we'd probably be opposed to her, not because we like what happened to her, but because we think the provision of the Human Rights Code is actually, and we've argued this before, many times we've lost, are hopelessly vague. They're very, very vague. We disagreed with the Supreme Court's decision in um, Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission and Watcott because we think that um, the publication provisions of the Human Rights Code, which um, are so loose they can cover all kinds of different things, um, although the su Supreme Court has tried to narrow what, what they mean, what the words mean, we think that they're vague. Um, that doesn't mean we like what has happened to Morgan, and it doesn't mean that we wouldn't stand next to her in denouncing it. Um, but we are concerned about the use of the legal tool. So I, I actually disagree again with the premise. I don't think uh, I heard agreement. Um, and our organization um, considers itself cross-partisan. Our, our last board president to the current one was a card-carrying conservative. I don't know the political affiliation of the current one, but we have everyone from conservatives to Marxists on our board uh, united around um, certain rights questions. So. And also not hostile enough that prevented you from asking your question. Well, <laughs> the, <That's a> <laughs> it took a lot of guts to ask the question. And you can see that nobody actually answered why there is not somebody who is a non-progressive on the panel and why that wouldn't have made for a better conversation. Anyway, I'll leave that with you and with the audience. That's really, uh, uh, the, the, the rest of it isn't profitable again because it is, I suspect it is a hostile Th Thank you for your question. Um, Kit. Just a quick point. Is it possible and appropriate when people speak that they just say who they are? Mm. Is that okay? <laughs> so uh, Kit is asking uh, that uh, when people ask a question, they introduce themselves. If, if they want, I don't think if, yeah. people should be forced to. Yeah. If they want to, if they choose to. No, yeah. to yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really appreciating the conversation in terms of state and legal recognition, but I was wondering if we could maybe reorient the conversation towards mutual recognition. And, you know, I don't have a problem with this kind of um, demarcation of left and right. I think, you know, it's somewhat real, somewhat fragmentary, but I think many of us here probably identify with the left. Don't think that's a huge problem. Um, I'm interested in discussing um, how we could potentially achieve this mutual recognition that's necessary to provide a countervalence to you know, the authoritarianism that is necessarily looming and how we can mutually recognize each other without um, falling into this propensity to liquidate all opposition. 
whether it's in discourse, whether it's um, you know virtual or non, you, I see a lot of tendencies um, and hostilities towards um, disagreements on the left, and you know not everything can be reduced to data or fact. Um, there's a lot of you know affective problems happening here. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk about some of the more micro and interpersonal um, issues we're dealing with. Should we just go in, go in order? Anyone? Sure, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thanks so much, Emily. That's a, that's a terrific question. Um, I would uh, say that I think sometimes the, um, the tendency within the left to shut down debate and discourse, uh, which, again, to reiterate, I'm seeing more and more, and I think is a real problem. Again, just to, to reiterate that point, because I'm not sure it got, got taken up or understood. Um, uh, I think some of it comes from a sense of, uh, uh, of powerlessness, um, isolation, uh, and um, a, a sense uh, that it is necessary to control um, the, uh, the, the discussion, to control communications. And, and I think that um, just to tag on to what, what Josh was saying about what can be done, um, I think that there, there needs to be um, perhaps some lessons learned from uh, organizations, political parties, like the Black Panthers, which is something like, rather than looking at, at the state, because as you recognize, this is a settler um, a, a state, it's a, 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 an organization of colonial violence, mm -hmm. so um, we have to look at it uh, dialectically, that it is both the, the source of some remedies, but also the, the source of a lot of um, uh, a lot of brutality as well, ongoing uh, brutality. Um, so self-organization, I think, is, is really important. And, and as we move forward, and our, as our state, I, I would, I, my sense is it's going to, be going to, it's going to become um, ever more authoritarian. We've already seen what's happening in the United States, and it's really disturbing um, with the child separations. Um, now, with the reorganization or with the, 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 the shuffling um, of the, the Supreme Court uh, and so on, this looks really, really uh, uh, dire. So I think self-organization is really important. We can learn from the Panthers' um, uh, provision of uh, school lunches to children in, in, in impoverished schools in Oakland, sickle cell anemia um, uh, uh, testing uh, programs, self-defense, uh, which was also in this province uh, manifested by the East Indian Defense uh, uh, Organization um, ag against uh, racism, against racist attacks. Uh, I think building communities up. I think is a positive dimension of, of this discussion. And it has to be within the realm of civil society. We can't simply look to the state and its laws to protect us. Because as we know, laws change. Even constitutions can change. More difficult, of course, but constitutions can change. And if we're caught unawares by these changes, then we're, we're not in a good place. So I think um, there are other such examples, you know, uh, slut walks, take back the night. There, there, there are a number uh, of examples. And of course, indigenous resistance has to be front and center as a model for self-organization uh, and um, uh, the, 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 the integrity of communities and their ability to resist. These kinds of things really have to factor into this. It's not about simply looking to legal, rec looking to legal forms of, of remedy. And also, of course, again, as I said, transforming the, 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 the social field in which hatred and racism and prejudice emerges in the first place. That has to be dealt with. So I, admittedly, I, I, I'm in the trenches, right? So I, I fight uh, for rights. Uh, that said, um, I agree that litigation is the last resort, and it's the most expensive and the least satisfying uh, when you get, even when you get it. Even though it's really satisfying to win something or change the law, changing the law is really satisfying. But uh, without changing the hearts and the minds, you've won nothing, right? All you've created is resistance. Um, the first step that we always applied in, 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 my, in my crew is uh, tends to be actually to access conservative spaces that might be amenable to our, to, our, to our message. And this is where our strongest allies come from. In, um, 
in, in the trans rights law work in BC, the, the way we managed to get the law changed here was we reached out to evangelical uh, churches in the Fraser Valley. And I, I, I spent an entire summer going from church to church to church to talk to the leaders and to try to convince them to, to take a slightly different approach on the pulpit. And, um, and those people, that work really paid off. There's no doubt that, um, that hearts and minds are won through education and advocacy and through personal relationships. Bridge building is much more powerful than, than uh, coercion. But that said, inevitably at the end, you get to your goal, you have your goal, and then you have to deal with the miscreants, right? The people who just refuse. They will not be changed. They will not do what you hope they would do. You can educate the next generation. That can be done in the schools and so forth. And, you know, everybody's on side except that very small group. And that group, unfortunately, is often intransigent and highly polarized by um, social media, which is a terrible disruptor in society. Um, it does a lot of good, I know, but it also does a great deal of, of damage to social discourse. And uh, yeah, it's used as a weapon by most people who really have a stake in, in Twitter, and this is really sad that this is what the tool is for. I don't want to take up, up much time, but um, um, for us, we've been watching with concern. We're not on campus. We don't, I'm not there to see what's happening, but we do hear uh, um, reports. Um, of all the deplatformings that are happening, of the the attempts to just stop um, people from talking at all or from being heard, and mm. um, I can understand the impulse that dr drives those feelings, mm -hmm. but it concerns me because I feel like I get better in the arguments that I make yeah. by by hearing, mm -hmm. uh, by testing them against those who I disagree with. Mm -hmm. And um, it strikes me that to some extent, and I don't think this is universal, but certainly in these high profile instances, you see somewhat of a trend, and I'm not in a position to document it, towards shifting away from the ability to have those kinds of interactions, while recognizing that Again, with the social media um, and the changes, like it used to be that you, you know, you would have debates on campus, and that's what what it would be. Now there's all this other accoutrement around it that creates mu a much more menacing atmosphere for folks. It's, it changes the experience. So I, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, but it is something that I'm concerned about. I'd also want to say that I don't think territorial recognitions should be considered as. Um, part of a progressive agenda. I think it's just a fact, it's a legal fact, that these are unceded territories. It was the Harper government who apologized, for example, for residential schools. It's something that should be cross-partisan. Yeah. yeah, just uh, po po pointing out, yeah. Um, we have uh, uh, time for a few other uh, questions, whoever is interested. Just I wanted to point out uh, that uh, with your question, I was thinking uh, what I often hear in the consulting room uh, coming from people who are in, um, let's say, uh, grassroots activism, that sometimes the, um, the anti-oppressive becomes oppressive, that there's no space for discussion about difference. And, and that's uh, uh, something so important to foster as uh, let's not make this anti-oppressive place an oppressive one. So. Um, yes, please. Well, I was sued for $5.6 million by Kinder Morgan. So I'm not going to throw away the state. I think uh, we've argued for anti-slap legislation for quite a while. And I'm not going to abandon that fight. And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get good legislation in the, in the fall. I think it's really important. As you said, what's happened with uh, slap suits is that we have more people that are afraid to speak out because they're going to get sued. They're going to lose their property. They're going to lose everything they have. And they're, or, and they're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars fighting uh, huge corporations in, in the courts. So we use the state. We have to use the state. And it's naive, I think, to, uh, to d deny that or to abandon that. We, we struggle to get our candidates. So elected. Saying that. 
Okay. He'll be saying that. Okay. We're struggling to get our candidates elected so that we can get power in the state. The, but the other thing is, I think, that we have to recognize is that, and as I think some people have said, that we are moving towards uh, fascism. It's a very scary situation uh, worldwide. And I think uh, what we have to recognize with fascism, it's not simply a matter of debate. It's a matter of economic crisis. We have a working class that's torn to pieces, uh, lost unions, lost representation, and they're being organized. Uh, the left is not organizing, uh, just as in Nazi Germany. Uh, the left is divided, terribly divided, on all kinds of grounds. And so we are losing the battle. We've, uh, we, uh, I work with the Canadian Anti-Racism Education and Research Society. So most of, a lot of our work is with uh, hate groups, and a lot of our work is with members of hate groups, and we try to work to get them out of those groups. And um, it's a very tough job because uh, the ideology has to be, has to be uh, understood and not just simply dismissed, as somebody I think was saying. We, but you know, the issue here is the crisis, the economic crisis. It's not simply a matter of debate here. It's a matter of changing the institutions. And it's going to involve mobilization. We brought 4,000 people to City Hall in August. But that's just a small number. We have to bring many more people out, many more people who are proud and courageous and who will fight. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, if, I just, if I could just respond to that. I mean, I think that's, that, that's absolutely right. And this is what I'm saying. We've, we've actually got to... Um, uh, diagnose the disease, which has to do with socioeconomic crisis, and the way that not just the crisis, but the way in which that crisis becomes framed uh, politically. Um, so the source of the crisis are the migrants. Um, the, the source of the crisis um, uh, is is the other. The source of the crisis um, has nothing to do with the structure of corporate power. So these are the kinds of things that we're more and more inhibited um, uh, from talking about because we're we're still so stuck in in identity questions. Um, not to say they're not important, but there has to be um, a, a view not just to the questions of recognition, as was recently put in a in a, a political philosophical. Uh, debate, but um, questions of redistribution and uh, questions of fundamental socioeconomic power, which I think is what you're getting at, Alan. Um, but no one's saying we abandon the state. Nobody's saying that. Um, we have to look at it as both a kind of mechanism, institutional structure of uh, civilization and of barbarism at the same time. I think this is really, really key. I, I think if I, if I could just sort of sum up uh, the argument that I was trying to make is that uh, the left has to be careful for what it asks for, because some of the things that it asks for, as, as Josh was was suggesting, um, can uh, turn against it uh, uh, quite quickly. And and you know, it was it was uh, Dworkin McKinnon, I, I believe, who had some input into the anti anti obscenity laws that were ultimately deployed against Little Sisters. And what did the customs officers really at attack target? A, a book by uh, a bisexual trans man. Uh, Patrick Khalifa, right? If, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, there, it, you see this over and over again: speech codes, um, uh, restrictions on uh, on, uh, on on what can be said when and and and, and how are often deployed against um, uh, often the ver their very advocates. And the Palestinian case is exactly uh, uh, to the point. If you talk about addressing the question of of uh, redistribution, um, the, the one person who's, who's do, forwarding this discussion in the most robust way is Jeremy Corbyn. But Co Corbyn is being attacked from both within the Labour Party and of course from without it, especially within the, the Tory party, for his anti-Semitism because he's critiquing uh, Zionism. They're conflating Zionism and, uh, uh, and, and, and um, so anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. This has, has got to be nipped in the bud, but we can't do that because we ourselves are so geared to creating protections for, for groups, which then tends to, to get overextended, overinflated in, in ways that becomes problematic politically. So uh, I think this is really, a, for me, the key issue. Um, so Just a question there. I don't have anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess to... I, I'm not on the right, but my question could be construed that way. Um, was the left wrong when they said money is not speech with reference to 
uh, the Citizens United case, and I guess I'm taking this opportunity to talk about it because of uh, Justice uh, Kennedy's stepping down from, from SCOTUS today. Um, just a, my second thought there simply is that the identity in this case matters the most. And I wonder if the schema, schema through which we've been discussing uh, this tonight, harm versus offense, doesn't really match the actual identity of a corporate body's right to free speech. And yeah, I mean, we need to get our heads yeah. around that probably if we're going to make progress. We haven't really got uh, talked about like speech restrictions in the context of elections, other than briefly touching on the Facebook. Collusion, no collusion. Um, there's totally no collusion. Um, uh, so I, th I think that's an issue that would, we could have. You, one could have a whole panel on just that. Um, I'm not sure that I know, know what you meant when you said was the left wrong when they said money isn't speech because I thought lots of folks on the left were um, uh, have complained about the inequality of economic resources in, at election time and and ar had argued that it it uh, it was and therefore more money meant more speech and um, that that wasn't fair um, so I, I think that those um, I think those questions around electoral participation uh, and uh, election advertising all that kind of stuff in the context of Facebook and I think really needs a a, a sharp look uh, that responds to the new reality. Um, uh, and I don't know what the answer ought to be, but. I guess my question really has to do with that old chestnut, chestnut about the rights of a minority within a democracy, as a minority. Not individuals within, within a protected class, but as a, a corporate body themselves. Do they have, is there a further in this case, Citizens United won the day as a corporate entity. Right. That could like corporate persons having corporate rights persons under the rights. law. So, That's I mean, in, yeah, no, there's a whole huge question around that. In Canada, they do. It's why, um, uh, although we regulate tobacco ads, those uh, ads do violate the that were found to violate the freedom of expression rights of those companies, but then it was found that that, that was justified under the circumstances. Um, by the way, it's the same way that the, a group like the BCCLA is able to go in and argue in court on a whole bunch of things. So I'm not sure it's um, I'm not sure it lends itself to an easy answer. I think there are good things you could think of and mm -hmm. harms that you could think of. Um, so I won't endeavor to try and conclude on it, but but there you go. Thank you. We are going to wrap up here. Uh, I really appreciate your presence here. I want to thank each of uh, one of you for your thoughts, for your uh, participation, for inspiring us. And um, if there's uh, any other questions, uh, there are going to be a few minutes here. Thank you very much. <laughs>